this panel is exciting because it really hits at some of the things that have been important that we've talked about so far. We heard Mark get started with, when do I actually start to scale my business? Like, how do I think about that from an investor perspective, from an executive and from a strategic perspective? We then had the team take us into, cool, how do I invest in people and get the right people in place to create an environment where I can actually go forth and execute and achieve or exceed the goals that I've set? Now with this panel, we've got some amazing leaders on here and I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves in a second. But with this panel, we're gonna be talking about where the rubber hits the road. How do I actually like get conversations going? How do I think about prioritizing my investments internally to make sure that my customers, the relationships I'm building with them and my prospects are really excited and delighted about what we have going on. So with that, um, we'll start with Jen. Um, Jen, could you please introduce yourself to, the, to our audience here? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Jenny Gartwa. I've got a big old fancy title, Chief Services Officer. Um, Go Nimble is a revenue operations company, and we are a consulting company at the end of the day. And Chief Services Officer means that I manage our delivery team, and I'm focused on creating a great customer experience. Awesome. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, for, thank you for joining us here today. We've got now Sandy White from Intercom. Sandy? Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sandy White. I manage the relationship management team for the Americas at Intercom. So focused on uh, growing the revenue base from all existing accounts uh, across North and increasingly South America these days. I'm excited to have you here, Sandy. And last but certainly not least, longtime MSP member, uh, Jamie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jamie Schwartz. I work for Airbnb and lead marketing for Airbnb for work. Uh, Airbnb for Work is the division of Airbnb that works with companies who want to use Airbnb for accommodations as well as experiences for things like team building. And we're really excited to have you guys here. And one of the reasons being is we've got such interesting perspectives. Everyone knows who Airbnb is, but there's a much smaller chunk who knows Airbnb for Work, right? Intercom, longtime MSP community, uh, sort of darling MSP sponsor and so on. And then we've got Jen and the team at Go Nimbly, which is really consulting and really thinking about some of these problems. So we're going to get great perspective here today. Um, but enough about me and introductions. Let's jump into it a little bit. And when we think about this and we did our prep session, we, we spent some time talking about how do we want to tackle all of this big problem? Like we could spend a month talking about customer relationships and retention. Um, but starting with the tactical aspect, thinking about you know, your, your Bain Capital model, right? People process, technology. Uh, how, how can folks start to think about prioritizing and thinking about making investments? Um, and Jen, let's, let's start with you on that. Sure. Uh, yeah, isn't this kind of the, the question, right? How do you prioritize your time? Uh, prioritize it in the right place and you're going to make the most impact. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of having that muscle to try to prioritize the right kind of work. And I think that's one of the hardest jobs of being an operator is, you know, choosing the work to do. So we've got a few frameworks that we use to prioritize problems. I think the biggest thing to think about is what are your actual customer gaps? Where do you see, you know, not actually meeting your customer where they want to be? And we think about whenever we go into a, a new customer, we look at kind of how are they prioritizing work? What are the categories of work that they bring to the table? And there's really three different categories that we see. The first one, kind of the most basic, ends up being like, your intuition based and that's you know you're feeling that something is wrong you know a rep explaining that a, that a process is is not going the right way it's just having that feeling that something is not going well and trying to prioritize that pain the you know next one that we see a lot especially in the san francisco area and in the tech industry is the experience based which is you know somebody in leadership goes to a different company and tries to redo the processes that they've once done. So taken, you know, we've solved this problem before, or you're going to have this problem, and you're doing a lot of your prioritizing based on your experience. And if you think about this as a, you know, pyramid, at the top, you've got sort of that customer-based view, which is put yourselves in the shoes of the customer, try to really understand the gaps that exist there, and prioritize based on that. So it's no longer kind of identifying the work streams and prioritizing those, but going gap first. I think that's I think that's a phenomenal way to think of it. I love that notion of the well. I've seen this problem before. I have this feeling about it. It's good to put a name on that. And I think Jamie, one of the things that we talked about a lot was how how Airbnb for work, while it is part of Airbnb, is like a startup 
within a, a, a bigger organization. Yeah, we operate pretty autonomously. So we are structured more like a typical B2B organization with sales, sales ops, marketing, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of our um, structure though has to be really flexible to this larger organization that we're a part of, which means we do change our processes pretty often. Like every three to six months, we change um, both the structure of our sales team and our go-to-market operations. It's just how nimble Airbnb operates as a company. And so that means we have to change all three of these very quickly. And so when we're thinking about which to prioritize, everything has to be built with flexibility in mind and scale in mind. So we have a pretty small sales team, about 10 people. So how do you scale all of our customers, which we have about half a million globally um, with just 10 people. So where do you focus your time and energy on? Um, and so it's really mostly around the people and process and the technology usually follows, but the technology is there to help us scale and then also be nimble when we have to change um, and pivot. And can I double click into that before yeah. we get to Cindy? How, how have you gotten your team comfortable in the, the sort of the constant change, right? For, and macroeconomically, there's a bunch going on as well, but like that, that sort of change first mentality. Yeah, it, it's not easy. Um, and also our sales team is probably probably a little bit more on the older side for like San Francisco. So I actually think it's been more challenging in that sense, um, kind of stuck in their ways. But um, I think acknowledging that it will change frequently and that that's just part of the job. And then knowing that there's trust in that the technology and the process will follow that they're not gonna be left to start from scratch every time, that we are building tools and processes and people around them to support them as we pivot so that they're not all of a sudden entering a new territory without the right marketing materials or the right um, Salesforce infrastructure. Um, so building that level of trust that we actually probably build that in first before we pivot so that we know that they'll be successful. Um, and because we do it so frequently, it, it now becomes this trusted understanding that, yes, the business will make them successful and that we're not going to leave them hanging. And adapt and, and make the, and be supported. It's not just, we're going to change and figure it out because you're smart. That, that's and, I think, uh, and also the why, I think it's really important to lead your team with, and this goes for any team you're leading, um, why are you doing it? And more times than not, it makes a lot of sense and it's the right thing for the business. And especially now more than ever. Uh, we see that we lead with customer empathy, customers first, and um, that also builds a lot of trust. Well, I think, I think that's a, a great point. And Sandy, I know when this comes to mind for you, one of the things that you mentioned was thinking about actually getting customer feedback in, and, and sort of using that as a lever. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I think this is really the, the right order um, when I think about how do you prioritize this stuff. Obviously, you know, getting the right people in, in the organization is, is key. And that's the number one priority, I think, of any leader. And when we hire, like, we really try to get people who are, uh, you know, not just going to come in and do a great job at the role that they're hired in for, but are also going to help contribute. And a lot of that actually helps build the process. And if you think about, like, some of the best people you've managed or had on your teams, a lot of times they're not just stars at the role they're hired into, but they're really, really strong in helping you, you as a leader or uh, you as a peer develop that process and build that out. And um, one of the ways that we, we've seen that manifest in recent days is really just been tr going through our sales cycle, sales materials, sales trainings, and thinking about how we break down the customer uh, life cycle and how our team approaches each segment of that customer life cycle. So for example, we've, we've really broken apart and put a lot of emphasis on those different pieces. Um, whether it's like the, the first touch, the onboarding, how do you run a really great engagement at that point in the sales cycle or the customer life cycle? How do you uh, run really effective QBRs and really get um, regular ongoing feedback? And as a part of that, uh, we, we built out you know, with our solutions team, really a great kind of feedback loop that gets uh, puts things on the radar of our product team and then gets processed in a really, really systematic way. Um, so it's not always just uh, a one customer shouting for a feature or hearing a hallway conversation from a, a rep or something about something that the team needs. It's really like vetted and really well thought out systematically on the process side. And on the technology side, I, I kind of feel that that should follow the process. Um, you know, there's a we think that like technology can fix everything sometimes. And in reality, a lot of things are still 
most easily done through spreadsheets and slides. And I, I usually trend towards, unless there's something like a house on fire or your team is like really clamoring for a technology solution to a big problem, then it's, you should err on the side of caution and go slowly and not rush and just roll out technology for the sake of rolling out technology. I think that was something that Mark Mark mentioned a few times this morning during our keynote. Like there are certain phases where doing unscalable things is the absolute right thing to do uh, because it allows you to really feel the pain and then you know what technology or process or person to hire. One one question on this, Sandy, you mentioned um, working closely with the, the solutions in the product org. Can you say just a little bit more about how you built, like was, was the impetus for it coming from products for kind of this customer feedback loop? Was it coming from sales was like, I need this feature. How did that, how did you guys kind of build it? And what was the genesis? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we've always had a lightweight uh, kind of feedback loop like that, but I think the biggest really impetus for us is that we have a global sales team, but most of our R and D is in Dublin where the company was founded. And so when you're thinking asynchronously about that, um, maybe I'm biased because I'm in San Francisco, but I feel like the, um, you know, it becomes very easy to just source feedback from the Dublin team in that case and not the global team. And I think that, you know, some of the efforts to make it more systematic has, has led to that. Obviously the time zone differences, um, you know, how are we going to get our folks in Sydney talking to the people in Dublin and make that a really clean, easy feedback loop. And some of it's just uh, growing pains at the stage and scale of the company you're at. I mean, we're 650 ish people right now, which is where you start to see a lot of those like early processes start to break or need improvement because you're not just paying the, the product people you know anymore. Like there's a lot of bases, a lot of divisions, a lot of different groups working on different things. And you need to really make sure that it's structured to, to get the job done. There's um, one thing Jamie and, and Sandy both kind of touched on. Um, Jamie talked about kind of prioritizing the why and Sandy, you were talking about finding people that want to make impact and, you know, going to this kind of, how do you prioritize things? I've found that like you really need a framework for your company and your team to lean on. Like you need to know what that North star is. And um, there's a few things that have really worked for us. Um, I'll give a, a shout out to Jay Zach as Lattice. He's the CEO there. But one time I, I met with him and he told me that they use this framework at Lattice that we adopted, which is ship, shipmate self. So when you're making decisions, you want to prioritize the ship, you know, what's right for the company, what's going to affect the most people, then your shipmates, kind of your teammates, your peers, other teams, and then yourself. And so really kind of thinking about that um, has really helped sort of prioritize like, hey, is this initiative something that like affects the whole ship? Or are we protecting our department? Are we protecting our team? And then so on and so forth. And that's been kind of a really good framework. And then for revenue operations, which is kind of where we play, we do a lot of prioritizing customer experience and prioritizing revenue. And so that also really helps when we're, you know, coming to a giant laundry list of things to fix, you know, which one's affecting the ship, which one's going to affect the most revenue and the best customer experience. And that's been a, a good framework for us. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's a great way. I've never actually heard that one before. Ship shift mate itself, it's it's great, and it also gives people right. Um, you know, Jamie, you mentioned some of the folks that you're working with maybe have a little bit more seasoning. It still gives folks like that some first principles to think through, right? Hey, how does this? This is how we make decisions. This is why what's important to us is important. Go ahead and operate in that in that um, you know within that framework. I love it. And. We've talked, we've talked a little bit about how to, how to kind of scaffold this up and how to think about making decisions. Um, one of the things that I learned more from is failures than successes. Today we had Zoom crash right after our keynote. We're all here, right? There was a moment of, oh shit, we'll remember it forever, but we, we adapted and overcame. So we learned a lot from that. Um, looking at and thinking about bad examples or bad prioritization um, what's, what's really the cost of a bad experience or bad, uh, you know, badness in that space or misprioritization of things. And Jamie, given that you've, um, you know, you've probably seen this a lot in your experience transitioning from sales function or sorry, sales function, sales motion to sales motion, maybe messaging to messaging. What are some of the things you've seen that just didn't work well and that you learned from and then applied later? Yeah, I mean, for us, obviously, like we're a major brand, and even though we're a small team within the larger brand, obviously, anything that happens to a customer um, kind of goes 
viral a little bit. So um, we are especially protective of our customers because they speak to the credibility and trust of the entire company. Um, I think some of the things that we've seen are, you know, the handoff. I'm sure this is familiar to everyone where, you know, you have someone leave or a new process and you kind of just assume your customers understand where you're going and it's a little more casual and um, we've seen that be very challenging um, when we've just kind of left customers hanging a little bit. Um, so that's definitely been part of it. And then also like um, back to Sandy's point about building the product, you know, when you're not involving your customers in what's coming next, why you're building what you're building, um, I think bringing them into the fold early on even if it doesn't speak exactly to their needs is important. Um, I think it helps build trust and credibility and also know that you are solving some customers' needs. It might not always be theirs, uh, but it, it shows that you listen. And so um, we've been a lot more thoughtful about letting our customers know what we're working on. It can sometimes be challenging. You have to be, especially at our company, a little on the confidential side, but um, we find that we've had really positive reaction when uh, we've been honest and upfront with them. And then sometimes they'll bring in another division that we weren't even aware of that will solve their problem if we're not solving like our main contact problem. I think we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about messaging, but there's a whole school of thought on transparency as a critical component of the sales motion. And I think the, the statistics show uh, a piece of a solution with a 4.2 to a 4.5 rating that admits its flaws is way better positioned to win a deal than somebody who says that they're perfect. So there's a lot, I'm sure there's a lot there that we'll get into when we, we chat about messaging. Um, but Sandy, you know, kicking it over to you, right? You've been with Intercom for some time. You've seen Intercom grow quite a bit and your team has expanded quite a bit. Where have you seen things kind of go off the rails and what's the takeaway that we want to give back to the, to the MSP audience here today? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually uh, agree with Jamie I mean, uh, about the cost of bad being more than just the customer. Obviously, it's bad to lose a customer, but in today's world, when everyone who is a customer is also usually like really active on Twitter in our space and really well connected and is leaving G2 reviews and all those things, the cost of bad customer is so much more than just that one customer and it, it just multiplies. Um, but as far as like, I actually referenced some, uh, something in a previous role that I think is a good example, but um, I think the real danger a lot of time is prioritizing just the internal metrics over the customer and the customer experience and the customer needs. And in this role, like I was, I was scaling up a large uh, SMB account management team and we were trying to figure out how many accounts would be ideal for one person to manage. And we looked at the numbers and I think we were pretty much driven by the finance aspect and just understanding like, what was the ROI of this role? How much would we need to, how big of a load would this each individual have to maintain in order to like hit the metrics we wanted? And the number we got to was somewhere, somewhere like 400 or 500 customers for each individual to be managing, which if anyone's tried that before, it's completely crazy <laughs> and just does not work. And the only way to really do that effectively is to like just blast out a million emails and scale everything. And at that point, you might as well just be marketing. Like you don't need an individual customer relationship manager. So, um, it, you know, in that case, I think the the proper way to, to go about it would have been to focus more on like, how does this, for one customer, how do we do this right? And how, like, what does that entail? And then from there, figure out, okay, how does that um, scale? Like how many customers can we do it? right for and then use that to build metrics off of and get to that kind of goal that we need to get to versus try to like shoehorn it backwards from, from where we started so just a quick example but that, that was what came to mind when we're talking about bad customer relationships because what happened was you know half to three quarters of those customers were neglected and weren't really much better off than when we started so I think that's a that's a great example. We had a conversation um, yesterday, some of the interviews we're doing at MSP around compensation. And it's the same kind of thing. Like if finance is like, oh, you should increase the quotas, probably maybe the right thing to do from a finance perspective, but like global pandemic, high rate of unemployment, like very high level of anxiety in people's personal life, maybe not the best thing to do for the business, even if the math kind of makes sense. Um, so. 
yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's always a tough conversation to have, but I think uh, they're, they're, if you're doing it correctly, you can get it to a point where you're going to add more growth through, through fewer but more dedicated customer relationships. Yeah, and I think that goes back even to what Jen and uh, Jen was talking about before with having, having some frameworks to have that discussion. While we as leaders, it's, no one likes to go talk to the CFO. I think sometimes there's this perception where CFOs are trained to say no to everything and they care about the purse strings and that's it. Like they're, that's partly true, but they're also people. They, they do understand that, uh, that aspect of it as well. And Jen, I know from yeah. where you sit too, you've got lots of perspective on this. So feel free to hop in here. Um, I have a, a fun thing that I learned about recently that I've actually seen work. So when we're talking about like a customer having an issue and like needing to fix it in order to make sure that they don't, you know, leave reviews or have this other effect, there's actually something called a service recovery paradox. And it basically says that a customer will have a higher kind of a perception of your brand and will be more loyal to you if you've had a problem and you fixed it than if they've had a perfect experience the whole time. So when we talk about like what's the best, you know, cost of a bad customer relationship, sure, the overall relationship, but in a moment, you actually have a really big opportunity to be human, you know, meet your customer, you know, step up, solve the problem and actually create higher retention. Um, I haven't yet figured out how to have a you know bad experience with every customer and fix it in order to have them stay, um, but I I have done it by mistake and we've we've had issues where we've gone back to our customer and you know some we have kind of on average our customers stay with us for like 18 to 24 months so it's like a pretty long consulting relationship and we're gonna have a mishap and those customers like once we've done that they just see that hey they're gonna meet me they're gonna be a partner in it they're going to be fair. And I find that sort of a very kind of interesting thing. We, you know, when we try to focus a gapless customer experience and like the perfect experience that that human aspect of correcting problems actually has a really big effect on your retention. And I think that's, that's something too, where we've heard of brands kind of pulling in some of their noisy, not unhappy, but noisy right. customers. Hey, yeah. here's the problems that we have. Help, help us to help you figure this out. And then you yeah. build that trust versus being, we're perfect. It works all the time. Don't worry about anything. Yeah. We've got it under control. Yeah, it's an equity exchange, right? It's kind of including them in, in the process. And that always kind of adds the extra relationship to it. Yeah. I think we, we've touched on this a little bit, but when, when we think about messaging, how do, how do you make sure that we're, we're putting the best foot forward, right? Like, I can go ahead right now and read more about Intercom without talking to anybody from Intercom than I've ever been able to in the past. I could go to Greenhouse to understand how folks feel about the organization, G2 Crowd and other systems that give me reviews. I have so much at my fingertips right now, but when we kind of come back to it, I still have to talk to somebody to, to make something happen and you still want to prospect into me. How do you how do you make sure that you're communicating effectively and your messaging is really landing in this world? And let's start with um, Sandy on this one. Yeah, good question. And we have a little bit of a leg up in, in my org, just that we, we're already working with a lot of clients, so we're not uh, cold outbounding. So we try to reference internal case studies as much as possible as we're going from one group to the next and expanding through that motion. Um, but across the board, I think when we are sending out messaging, I like to make sure that we're we're automating a lot of the sends with human follow-up where we're necessary. Um, I think that there, like one way or the other, doesn't always work. You can't just blast a million updates to your your client base and expect them to read them all and understand them all and get get through. Uh, but I also think that you, if you're just trying to reach out one client at a time, one by one by one, it gets really tough to customize that at scale and find the time for each each individual to do that. So I think that, that that piece is is the preferred motion. And we, we try to make sure that like we give our team a heads up when there's marketing things coming out, that they're doing fast follows, that they're jumping in and really like adding that human element or calling out things that are, are gonna be like relevant to that individual client because they're not always relevant to everyone. Um, as far as like framework narrative, I think that the, it's definitely tough in our, in our uh, space because there are so many competitors and we have so many different use cases that our, our product serves. But we really try to make sure that people understand why we do what we do. 
and we talk about the customer communication platform. We talk about more than just chat. We talk about uh, the customer support funnel and what that looks like. And just make sure that people really, really get a good understanding of who we are before they really dive into what we do and how we do it. I think that's sort of sales fundamentals, a- but it, I think it never is, uh, it, it always rings true, I'll say that. Well, and I think it's even back to what um, Sales Loft was saying earlier in the open mic section and what we've heard time and time again in MSP, you can't, you can't just automate and you can't just fully personalize. There's a happy medium between those two to drive the the best relationship that you can for the business. And Jamie, I know I know that you've got, and you mentioned you've got uh, this, this large number of customers and potential customers out there. Where do, how do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, as a marketer, you know, I think it's super important for me to be close to the customer. So I'm on a customer call like once a week, and I encourage anyone who works with marketers to bring them into your calls because I think it starts with, you know, marketing should really understand what the customers are saying and not just when you're interviewing them in the perfect time when they're panicked or they have an issue, like that's when you should be listening to your customers the most, especially from a marketing person to understand like what the right messaging and positioning should be. And then I also think it's important to know what your customers are reading. Uh, There's actually a lot of tools that we use to do listening on like what our customers are looking at, but then you should also be not only looking at what's going on in your industry, but like what are your customers really noticing and caring about right now. And that should help shape, you know, a lot of what you're um, discussing. But then, you know, we do find for us, like it definitely does um, lean towards industry specific um, more than not. So uh, different industries care about different things, especially during peak seasons or for specific use cases. So, uh, you know, learning as much as you can about your customer, but then you know, this goes without saying listening is super important. And I think starting with uh, the listening piece and then bringing that information as a salesperson, I'm lucky I'm very close to my sales team and I get a lot of information from them and that helps shape a lot of our messaging. That's, I, I wish I wish some of the marketing leaders I had worked with in the past would uh, hop on a call. There's, there's actually a great story about um, uh, the CMO of one of the intent companies actually sat at a desk and did cold calls for a day, the SDR team. So really that that firm alignment, that that firm handshake between sales and marketing, I'd, I'd, I'd love that, I think it's a great way. And then Jen, I, I, you, you sit again, kind of in a unique position here, but how do you how do you kind of make that work um, at, at uh, Echo Nimble? Yeah, uh, my brain's going in a lot of different directions because we just like covered a ton of ground. Um, so I'll start here. One of the things that we just talked about is like, essentially personalization at scale, right? Like Jamie, you're kind of touching on that. And like Sandy, you even referenced it. It's like, how are we going to have uh, all this personalization go out? And Beck Holland obviously does a really fantastic job of, you know, personalization at scale and, and all that content. But one of the things rolling this out internally one, and also with our customers that is really been difficult is that it feels like a formula or a process. And all of a sudden we've taken away that kind of human piece. It makes it like, hard to feel like you're personalizing and trying to like break through that barrier. And the focus that we've had there is really coming up with, again, I love frameworks. So you guys are going to get mad at everything that I've turned into categories, but that's what I do. And looking at like creating brand pillars for everybody to sort of follow in their messaging. Cause at this point, everyone's a content writer at your organization. Like that's, that's where we are now. It's not messaging is not a marketer's job. We can create the pillars and we can create the framework and our style guides and all that good stuff. But we've got, you know, SDRs, AEs, other people in our organization talking directly to our customers. So we have to come up with, you know, what is that framework? What are those pillars? For us, it's human, bold, and crafted. So we look at all of our messaging should follow that. And it also gives us a really easy way to give feedback to somebody that has put out content that maybe needs to be stepped up where we can say, Hey, this isn't really human enough, or, you know, the, it's not crafted. It's not, you know, specific enough, or maybe it's not bold enough. Like, Hey, you're saying the same thing that everybody's saying, like we have to kind of step out and, and do it a little bit differently. How do you, and I, Jen, I want to double click yeah. into that. How do you, how do you actually get the folks up to speed on what that means? Right. Those are, I think, great, yeah. uh, great terms, but how do you, how do you get them up to speed? 
Totally. Uh, this was actually one of the hardest things I think for me and, and or like my biggest kind of step that I've taken as a leader in the last like year, year and a half. It's like I had a really big like ego issue when it came to enablement like I would get frustrated when things weren't. I was like, I already did that training or like I already put that out. Like, why aren't you referencing, referencing like what I wrote or like I did a whole like, you know, company wide meeting on it. And I kept getting, I didn't say it, but I was like very frustrated. I've, I've learned that anytime you get that like tightness in your chest, it's really a you problem. Like you're getting triggered and like, it's not really, you know, anything anybody else did. And that was, uh, you know, if this was a therapy session, we could go a little bit deeper, but, um, it, I had to sort of like take a moment and, and realize that like it's repetition, it's clarity, it's my job to make that clear and it's my job to give feedback. And it really does come down to doing that repetition. I think Jamie was talking about marketers being on calls, for example, and like being closer to your customer. You know, one of the things that, you know, we have to worry about is doing that at scale and, you know, conversational marketing is a really good example, right? Same thing with messaging. And I think there's some products out there where you can do this on email, but listening to calls, viewing the content, giving, you know, feedback to, to people, helping them step up and identifying, you know, what that individual's backhand is. Like, what is the thing that they have to work on? Where is their struggle and creating opportunities for them to practice that in your organization? And it's not, I mean, it's time consuming. It's not easy. There's no kind of magic bullet. You can come up with as many tip sheets as you want, uh, but you have to let somebody practice it and you have to be kind of willing to give that feedback. And I, that's, I, I love that. And there's actually a couple questions that come in on this. And I'd love to hear from Jamie as well. How do you, how do you get to consistency in messaging uh, across your organization? Or how, once you've trained on something, how do you kind of verify that it's being put into into use from a messaging standpoint. Yeah, I was on a customer call right before this, and uh, my sales team let me in on some messaging that I had definitely not approved. You're basically <laughs> pitching a new product that doesn't exist and won't. <laughs> uh, so it is Those difficult. Never <laughs> to sell stuff that doesn't exist. That's never happened. Right. Exactly. They were like, "We have this great new program." I'm like, excuse me. Um, but I think. One, I mean, it starts with, you know, if you are working in tandem with sales from the get-go, they trust that this is the right content and that you can, you know, they can rely on you. I also think just letting them know, like I said, I was on a, another call um, a couple of days ago and that started uh, some new messaging that we kicked off. So having that relationship with sales so that they are coming to marketing when they need it, when they need help. Um, is really important to build that trust. At, but, at, you know, at a company like Airbnb, we talk about this at the executive level. I mean, there's so many messages going out across all of Airbnb's channels. I think, um, I think Jen might have mentioned it, like going back to the brand pillars and like really instilling that early on in everyone so that at least if you are crafting your own messaging, you are constantly thinking about what the company stands for. You know, I think we're lucky in the sense that everyone knows the high fidelity and equity our brand carries. And so there's a lot more thought, I hope, <laughs> most of the time that goes into what we put out there. Um, so people feel like an added responsibility to keep that brand um, integrity. But um, it, it can be difficult when sales gets flustered, I think, with a customer. So, you know, I just try and make myself as the only marketer right now <laughs> as available as I can be to get on those calls and to help um, and do some prep work and then start to think about what are the problems we want to solve at scale and build for those. I, I love, I, I think that's a great point. You kind of meet the sales team where they are and hear it and see it. And then you go like, oh, wow, that was, I'm surprised that they did this innovation. I hadn't thought of messaging this way. And then oftentimes you're like, hold on, what, what did you just say? You're selling what now? Excuse me? <laughs> I can't share what it was, but it was pretty interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandy, I, I wanted to actually get your perspective, and, and Ross actually asked a good question. It's a little bit of a variation of this, but reinforcement of, of internal education. We've talked about this from a messaging standpoint, but Sandy, you got a big team scattered across a bunch of different time zones. How do you reinforce the education that's going on? And then secondly, how do you get feedback from that team about what's working and what's not from a training standpoint? Yeah, great question. Um, it's actually kind of references the previous question too. So uh, I'll just kind of talk to you about what we've been up to this year. And I think there's a lot of themes at play there. So we went 
pretty much all in on command of messages here. And I don't know how many people are familiar with command of the message. I think most people in the sales world are probably at least tangentially familiar with it, but um, it's a sales framework and it's, it's a great one. Uh, it's probably my favorite that I've used. And the best thing about what they do is they make it really tailored to your own company. So they came and did like a huge boot camp um, with some of our top uh, managers, reps, and built out like the actual value drivers and the messaging behind those and how we should be communicating those. Um, and then we have it all laminated. There's a, a joke on our one team that, you know, you're not a real grown up sales org until you have a laminated binder that sits on everyone's desk, which I think a lot of us can, can uh, remember from times in our, our history and our careers. But um, the cool thing about that, to that previous question, is that that wasn't just a kind of sales kickoff activity for the sales team. It actually was the marketing team that was involved with that as well. They were in all the training, same trainings the sales team was. Um, it was our sales ops team. It was sales development. Pretty much anyone in that greater org. So not necessarily just people that are engaging with clients every single day, um, but pretty much across the board, like everyone had an understanding of, all right, what are we, what's our goal here and how we speak about our company, how we identify the value we bring, how we frame that. Um, so a lot of like great stuff there and also like got to give credit to the command of the message folks because their follow-up is intense. I don't know if anyone's rolled it out full scale across the company, but like it is a long and intense follow-up. So Everyone on our team is who went through that training has been doing weekly videos for 13 weeks. Um, it's a video, it's about an hour per week of video enablement training questions. Uh, we get completion reports as managers and directors, and it's, it's forwarded out to the whole org every single week. And if your team is not completing those, you are, are on the hook. So, uh, you know, it's a little, a uh, little intimidating but it is a, a really great way to keep reinforcing. And I'd also give a shout out to our enablement team. They've done a really good job of like distilling those down each week and giving all the managers great talking points that they can use in their team meetings. They join the team meetings. They lead their own kind of customized trainings per team. Just this morning, we had one uh, with just our relationship management team. That was a, a great, uh, really great training for, for us specifically. And just kind of translates it from that broader you know, one size fits all um, sales training for our company and gets it really compartmentalized for each group. I think that's a, that's a, a great way. I can, that's a 13 weeks of recording an hour of video. It's got to get you pretty, pretty dang good at something. Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was definitely helpful because I think uh, Jen was speaking about it, but I've heard the stat that uh, you need to repeat things seven times before they really, really stick with most people. So if the more reinforcement, the better. Um, I think with any of these trainings, you just want to keep repeating it till, till you get blue in the face. And that's when it finally gets ingrained in people's, uh, in their brains and they, they actually make a habit out of it. It's so hard. <laughs> Incredible. Especially uh, when you have 18 other things going on that you're yeah. trying to share, right? Yeah. I think, um, I actually have a question for you, Sandy. Like, are you, are you guys like all the examples that you're talking about are like, it really feels like there's not a ton of silos going on at your organization because like you're talking about getting involved with marketing, getting involved with CS, like being with sales and like you're going across the entire customer experience, which is for the most part when we're coming in with our customers, not the case, right? Like departments protecting their own, you know, team, their own metrics, their own technology, their own processes. And that being like the biggest piece of friction that we get to this idea of prioritizing the best customer experience, which everybody can say yes to. But in practice, it's, it's been so hard. Like, are you finding that? Cause I'm like listening to your stories. And I'm like, gosh, that's like such a great example of what everybody should be doing. Yeah, I won't say we're we're silo free by any means. I think you know everyone could always improve uh, their their cross functional collaboration, but it's definitely been a bigger focus for us in the last year. And I think some of that is just identifying gaps. Some of it's new people joining the team, mm -hmm. new leaders joining the team, and some of it's also just size and stage related. I yeah, think you, when it, you're under a few hundred people, it's you don't 
really have to think about it that much because it's really easy to know who everyone is and right. just collaborate quickly on the fly. Um, and obviously in big, big companies, the process is really ironed out. And when you're kind of in the mid stage and the growing scaling phase, you just have to put a lot of thought and energy into defining that, defining what the process is and building it out. Yeah. I mean, Jamie's the perfect example. She's, you know, in marketing and sitting with every single one of her sales reps and knows them all and, and is, you know, sitting on calls, but that's not always the case, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, I think I, you bring up a good point, Sandy, about like company maturity and organizational maturity. I mean, even when we grew at our peak to like about a hundred, you know, still everyone knew everyone, everyone really understands what everyone else's roles are. Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy to kind of, you know, everyone kind of works with each other. But as you start to grow, you know, you hire marketers who only do marketing, who come into that space. Um, you know, it's kind of why I've stayed in the small um, space because I like, um, that nimbleness and I like everyone kind of understanding how everyone else's roles work with each other. Um, but if you're in a big art organization, it's definitely hard, but I think it goes into like this next piece of like, you know, w functions are changing, especially now more than ever. I mean, I've led sales teams. I know marketers who have, and uh, sometimes I'm doing sales calls by myself. <laughs> you know, I'm not getting the commission, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely asked to kind of lead some of the calls for one reason or another. So um, I, th I think that's just a natural evolution too of where things are going into this con consultation type of marketing sales go to market function. Yeah, and I, I think Jamie, it'd be great if you actually expand upon that because you've, you've seen it from a lot of different angles. Um, is, is the nature of sales, is the role of sales changing? And where do you see it going? What's the future look like of this, this discipline? Yeah, I think so. I think to be, I, I explain it kind of how I explain my role. To be a good marketer, I need to understand how sales works, both from an operations perspective as well as from a customer relationship perspective a day-to-day -day perspective and I think vice versa. I see our sales team like really digging into like my role and how it works and how they can contribute, whether it's like, oh, I think I can write a good blog post or, oh, I should post more on LinkedIn. Like, yes, it's a sales type of activity, but it's also helping from a marketing perspective too. So I, I think it just goes into just understanding how businesses operate. You know, again, I've worked at mostly smaller companies, even within Airbnb. And so I know how, you know, our head of operations things and our finance things and things like that. And I think to be really skilled at sales, you should have an understanding, one, from your own company perspective, but then two, that makes you a better seller because you understand how stakeholder groups work. Uh, I think that's the one thing as we've moved up market, sales has gotten some insight. I am a big buyer at Airbnb. I buy a lot of technology they don't do that every day. So they don't understand always the stakeholder challenges. So when I bring them into the fold and they start to understand how that works, then they can apply it to how they're selling. Yeah, something we actually had a call with um, CEB, who's the publishers of Challenger Sale and all of that. The, the average buying group now for, I think it's over $30,000 piece of software is 11.7 people. That's insane. Here like, I thought it was getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I, right, we're all we're all surprised by that, but that does speak to the nature of buying is changing. So, to the nature of sales, um, sales should adapt. Sandy, I, I love uh, you know we've worked with Intercom in the past, and you guys have gone through a lot of different evolutions. How how do you think? What's the future of the discipline look like? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. The future of what? Uh, the future of the the discipline. The future of sales. What is that? Uh, what is that? Kind of look like? Um, yeah, good good question. And I I think the the biggest shift that I see, I don't, it, it, sales is kind of a cop-out answer, but sales is changing and it's not changing in some ways, right? The fundamentals are still, the fundamentals, they're still effective. You still really need to be uh, really tied to your customers, understand the business challenges that they're facing, how you can help them um, and be really proactive that way. But the thing that I think I've seen changing the most, I almost feel like the kind of self-education pendulum has swung back from, where it was because I remember about, I don't know, 10 to 15 years ago, it was like so exciting that people could self-educate and buyers could really like find all these materials. And like a lot of things I think with the internet, like it was early stages were like great for access to information and you could just go out and like 
you didn't have to like talk to a sales rep as step one. You could talk to a sales rep as step like seven and you'd already done most of your background research and had a pretty good opinion going in. Um, I almost feel like there's so much material on education and marketing stuff out there now that it's almost like too hard to like self-educate. Whereas if you're a buyer and you're trying to figure out what the best solution is, you go to G2 and there's 50 different products. And especially if you're in the, the B2B tech space, like we are, um, you know, there, there's so many companies that can just start up so quickly and do certain things that you might do. So I think that buyers can educate a ton now and it's almost overwhelming with how much information there is. And so it kind of brings it back to that uh, role of, of someone in sales who really needs to like help them cut through that, like get the right signals out, or at least like clearly explain what your company does uh, to the question earlier on how to frame it. Just really hearing directly, because if I'm a buyer, I, mean, I could spend millions and millions of hours reading everything out there that's written by everyone on the internet about a product, but like I would rather really just hear it from a sales team directly. And I think that's what we what we see and what we see a lot at MSP events as well as the, the question always eventually after a couple of beers gravitates toward. So how are you actually doing that? Like what's your tech stack look like for that? And Jen, I know you've seen and you've you've certainly at the forefront of revenue operations as a discipline, but how do you see kind of sales evolving as we go? Yeah, I mean, I think Sandy's point is right that, you know, sales has to change to meet the customer and the customer is always evolving. And, you know, one of the things that I think is really unique is to look at, you know, what our expectations are when we buy any products. So even thinking about B2C companies and what they've done to prioritize the experience. And in B2B, we're just not there, right? We're not doing the same sort of experience that kind of our B2C counterparts are doing. And so I do think that kind of the expectations in your day-to-day -day buying is go is influencing. You have the same kind of expectations when you're buying a piece of software for your business. And so it's just about kind of trying to meet that expectation. In terms of like how's the kind of role of a salesperson changing, and I, I think I see it as a little bit broader as sort of a revenue team, and Jamie was alluding to this, is generalists make more impact, right? So somebody that really is knowing how to have their depth and apply it everywhere and be able to kind of meet whatever need the business has or the customer has is going to perform better. And so I'm going to steal a quote that my business partner, Jason said, and I, I hope I have it right, but like you want somebody to sound like a marketer, create urgency, like a sales rep and listen to your customers, like a customer success representative. And you kind of need, you know, all of that these days from a, from a sales perspective, like it's no longer about just closing that you're creating relationships. You need to be representing your product correctly. And so that role has been elevated. I don't think, and I think especially the SDR role, I think that that's really evolving. I think our expectations of what an SDR does and the importance that that role has as like the first human contact for our customers is really changing. I think the, the nature of the SDR role, especially, and you mentioned it at the beginning, it's there's so much content that they're authoring and pressing through. It's, it's an important one. Um, we've got about 10 minutes to go here with our panelists. We've got some good questions in the Q&A panel. But folks, if you do have questions for this amazing slot of panelists, do throw them in there. Um, before we jump into that, though, let's just get some takeaways and think about this like this is somebody says, give me one tweet, not a paragraph, not an essay, just one thing we want folks to take back from this tweet link. Um, and let's start, Jamie, with, with you, and then we'll go Sandy, and then Jen, and then we'll take, as the questions come in, we'll take those. Yeah. No I'll, pressure. No, I'll say um, something that I've seen work really well for us, and that has also helped me as the marketer get more involved, because I always get asked, like, how do I get my marketers to care more? And I think as a salesperson, or your product people, um, I think as a salesperson, my advice is that you tell the customer story like not just oh this feature needs to get fixed like really tell the story of the pain points and challenges your customers are facing both you know to your internal stakeholders as well as your managers because that's i think where you see the most change happen and so you know right now we're doing a lot of that with um just understanding who our customers are, what they care about to get things done at the company. And I find if it's not about fixing this feature or because the customer is going to leave, but if you really tell a good story as a salesperson, um, you know, you can make a lot of headway with your uh, stakeholders that you're dependent on. 
Sandy? Yeah, I'll uh, go back to the first question. I think that the way that that question was laid out is the the perfect way to build your team, right? To think about people first. And if you're building a team of great people who are really uh, engaged in thinking about how to build a great uh, company, they're going to be thinking a lot about process and give you really great ideas to, to build out great process. And then once you have that great process in place, or at least a good process in place, you'll probably find some areas where technology can help you out and can, can help in, improve the results you're seeing. Um, but all of you try and come out at the other direction and just get technology first and then process and then find people, it's going to be, be really challenging. So people, uh, process technology in that order. Jen. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, you said, um, you said make a tweet out of it. So I'm gonna make a tweet out of it. Um, uh, you probably don't know what it's like to be your customer hashtag it's more complex than you think i love it i think I, that's that all phenomenal phenomenal points here we've got about five minutes for questions and the the first one and i think this is something that's top of mind for a lot of folks we've got a pandemic going on we're in renewal situations with folks who've maybe had their budgets frozen or reduced what are some of the creative messaging strategies you're using or tactics that you're doing to, to get folks to stay on board and maximize retention. Um, and Sandy, do you mind if we start with, with you on this one and then we can see if our other panelists. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we actually did a, a, our own sort of like COVID relief program. Um, and I am a little hesitant to broadcast this super wide because we, we did it only when customers requested it. We didn't want every single person asking us for discounts, but I'll share. Um, so when, when COVID first hit, hit we offered uh, one or two months of uh, COVID discounts or sometimes even waived it completely um, because we are, we're going to air our business. A lot of times we're focused on run rate versus each individual month's uh, revenue, which is nice. But also like we wanted to make sure that um, we, we could show a lot of this, the customers, especially ones that were hit directly, like people in the event space, travel, things like that that we cared. And so we did it on uh, inbound only and on discretion of the rep and our management. Um, and we would, you know, we would push back on people and make sure that they gave us like a real valid reason. Um, if people just came to us and said, you know, my C CTO told us we need to cut costs and you guys are it, like, that's not enough. Like we want to make sure they can really like tell us why they're, they're impacted by COVID. But if they were and you know, 90 plus percent of the time they were, um, we were able to, to give them some financial discount. And actually like we've had a couple clients recently come back and sign uh, much bigger deals and cite that mm -hmm. as one of the reasons, which is really like awesome to see and like heartwarming and just like really like validates that it, it's, it wasn't just the right thing to do, but also a good business decision. Service recovery paradox. I wrote that down and never heard that term <laughs> before, but I'm going to share that broadly and I love it. It, it absolutely rings true in this case. Mm -hmm. That's it's, it, it's definitely one of those ones where there's, there's no one right answer for it. And this, this has come up in, in MSP in the community a lot and on discussions like this, but there's do right by your customer and nine times out of 10, they're going to do right by you. There's still going to be some knuckleheads out there that try to take advantage of it. But by and large to Sandy's point, that's I think consistent with what we've heard in the community as well around to take care of them. They come back around from where they remember uh, because they're down and maybe out on their luck right now. And when it comes to like, you know, those sort of situations and they are case by case, I think the big thing that we try to do is really meet them with like an equity exchange. Like I'm not just going to cut $10,000 from your invoice. Like I'm struggling too. like we're a business too. And um, so we kind of look for that like, hey, look, if we get you through this period, are you going to come back and, and sign a bigger deal? Or are you going to like commit to us longer term? Or is that your intention? Or going beyond and saying like, okay, I learned this in a negotiation class um, that I took with, I'm not going to remember her name. So I'll share it afterwards because I hate stealing people's ideas. But um, she is a, a professor at Wharton. And the idea that like negotiating, everything's on the table. Like 
be more creative in what you bring. Be human. Really be thinking about what it is that you need. It's not just cash right now, right? Like if that's a thing that's that's there, can we do something like can you write a case study? Can you refer me elsewhere? Uh, something that I say a lot because I know that people in SF change jobs a lot. Can you take me with you when you leave? Like can you commit to be our champion when you go to your next gig? But like try to find that other thing in an equity exchange that we can do. Obviously, you can get creative with payment terms, put them on a payment plan, etc. cetera. Uh, don't be like we work and make me pay $50,000 a month and um, not use the space um, and not give me anything in return. I tried to be creative with them and they just um, steamrolled me. But um, getting you know to a place of, again, being human and being creative um, and trying to get through that friction with a little bit of uh, creativity. I, th I think that's a phenomenal point. And the other thing too that I'd, I'd add to this is there's, th this is also a good time to have a strategic review of your customers and see who, who should, if they came to you and said, hey, we want COVID relief, who should you let out, right? Not all of your customers are going to make it through this. And if you can even help them in that way, it's counter to some yeah. of this, but it's back to that creativity point. The, the customers that you know shouldn't be your customers anymore because their business is in trouble. It's, yeah. it's probably time to, to do the right thing there as well. Yeah, we were working with a big old casino at one point and we were just like, you're good. Like, we get it. <laughs> like, uh, call us when you're back in action and we'll go from there. And, the, and they'll remember that, right? And it's yeah. back to that, that uh, service, our service recovery paradox. That's, right. that's kind of printed on the back of my yeah. eyes here. Um, last question that we have, um, that we have time for here. And Jamie, I wanna, I, I'd love your perspective on this. We spent a lot of time today talking about customer relationships, building valuable customer relationships, maintaining valuable customer relationships. As a, as a sales-oriented marketing leader, how do you think about that from a metrics perspective, right? Obviously, revenue is great, but really, what are some of the metrics that we can share with folks that they can think about this through? Yeah, we have programs where we bring customers into the fold, whether it's through product enhancements, um, marketing collateral, logo usage, et cetera. And I place as a marketer a heavy value on those types of customers. And so, you know, I work very closely with our sales team on how, you know, even rewarding them, how many of those can you get um, and giving added, um, you know, recognition for adding people to these programs. And then also as a marketer, like, you know, I'm measuring the value of our relationships based on these types of companies that we can use, whether it's for referrals, whether it's for testimonials, quotes, et cetera. And that all comes from building good relationships. I mean, I don't, I haven't built those relationships with these companies, my sales team has. And so, you know, it's really valuable um, to a marketer. So if you can show that, um, there's a lot there. And I encourage marketers and sales leaders to um, reward their their teams for that because um, the value of a good customer quote, believe it or not, um, especially for a, a large company is, is huge. And so um, I place a lot of value on those types of relationships. And then we, we also categorize them like, so from an operations and scale perspective, like as strategic accounts. And so the more you can have the better. And also looking at how you convert a regular customer into a strategic account, even if they're not, and strategic shouldn't always mean a dollar amount. You need to look at it from different angles. I think that, and I think that lines up actually with a lot of what Mark was saying this morning about once you start to think about expanding maybe into other markets, right? Where's the land and where's the expand? Who's the reference or lighthouse client that you can get in? Maybe it's quick service or streaming or whatever industry it is. That's, that's worth its weight in gold if the rest of the industry will follow that. I think that's a, that's a phenomenal point to wrap on there, Jamie. Um, panelists. You guys are all awesome, awesome people. You're all rock stars and you're all very, very busy. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day to share and prepare for this panel um, and share amazing insights with the MSP community. Um, as on behalf of everyone who's here now, the community, folks watching this in the future, I really wanna thank you for, for spending this time with us. It was super, super valuable. So thank you all so, so much.